how many quarterbacks have we seen from this Elite 11 process end up having to transfer? More than 50%. And coming out on the other side of it, right? As, as Chris Peterson mm-hmm. shared with us last year into the quarterbacks, in yeah. Elite 11 was the only guarantee is that it's not going to go how you envision it. Mm-hmm. Like, is there is there a thought? Is it like so true? Compete to find the joy. Compete to get lost in the work. Like, what is it? Because it is going to become a world that has an exit door you can take. Yep, anytime. Or one that will hit you with adversity and you're going to have to deal with it. Jaden Daniels, and Caleb Williams, Bo Nix. I mean, it's impressive. It's impressive because it's hard. I know to go in a new environment, to have to relearn everything again, and to still have that confidence to say, you know what, it didn't work out in this other place, but it's going to work out here and now, and I'm going to own it. Welcome back or welcome to Why Option. I am your host, Yogi Roth. And no, we are not in California. We are on the absolute opposite side of the country. If you can see behind me, we're in one of the greatest settings in the history of ball. Jim Thornby, welcome back, man. You're on the West Coast. I'm on the East Coast. I'm at Pitt. This is my old team room in the facility on the south side of Pittsburgh today, baby. So we're going to talk Pitt. We got a great guest today in Jake Heaps. We're going to talk about that in quarterback playing. Oh, by the way. In this facility, the Steelers practice. And oh, by the way, Jay Keeps trains Russell Wilson. So we'll get to all of that. But Jim has the West Coast. That's brother. great. And uh, you know what? I think people, you know, we, everyone associates with you with the West Coast for being out there for, you know, 20 plus years, starting with your days at SC. But I don't think people really I, understand or acknowledge enough, like, your history there with Pitt. And, I mean, talk about the insane wide receiver room that you were a part of when you were in college. <laughs> yeah, it, it was nuts. So we're going to have some really cool images on this uh, article at yoption.com because I've literally been gawking around the facility at all of the new imagery. This is a brand new facility. Like 20 years ago to the day is when this facility opened, when I was a true freshman 20 years ago. So let that sink in, number one. Number two, this facility has had major renovations, uh, and I'm sitting in one of them. This team room, it is slanted. It used to just be like flat with like basically folding chairs. And within those folding chairs were Bolitnikoff winner, Antonio Bryant. Bolitnikoff winner and a guy who should have won the Heisman, Larry Fitzgerald. Two guys that were both my roommates in college, uh, let alone Latif Grimm, who was an All-American. RJ English, who went to the NFL. Lamar Slade, Chris Slade's younger brother who went out to play for the Steelers, among other teams in the NFL, and so on and so forth. And it's funny you ask that because his practice ended today on the practice fields. And oh, by the way, the grass smelled the same. <laughs> the turf felt the same. I walked out there and I like sprinted out there, bro. Like it literally felt like I was playing again. Like it's just, it's embedded in you. Like to, to those watching now at wildfire.com or listening, think back to like a for, like a, your formative years when you played sport, right? Like, I don't know what it was for you, Jim, but was it a basketball court that you played on growing up or you go back there now, you feel it, right? This may come as a shocking surprise to you, but I knew I was on this side of the of the sports world all long, long, long ago. So, <laughs> okay, all right. Well, maybe when you walk into like that first studio yeah. in uh, Tucson uh, when you were producing, exactly. uh, so if I to, if I yeah. go back to uh, my KVOA days when I uh, used to be the the weekend editor uh, when Savannah Guthrie was doing uh, weekend news, yeah. so that's how long. I, if that kind of puts into perspective how long ago that was, but yeah, totally. But, but it was anyway, the practice field smelled the same. And I went out there and the minute I got out there, and Coach Narduzzi is amazing. Like he is 10 years on the job. And from day one, I talked to him his first couple weeks on the job. He's been a stud to all of the alums and, and myself, right? Like I wasn't a decorated player here, uh, but I leveraged this place. I learned so much and it's built my career. Like it was a launching point, which I want to get to in a second. But practice ends to your question about receivers. And he goes, hey, I want you to talk to the wideouts. I want you to talk about that era because we're having these debates. I went to a guy named Chris LaSala who is just a lifer here. He's been here 30 years, just a rock star, was here when I was here, kind of just oversees all of football and many other things. And I said, am I jacked up? Like in my brain, our team was so talented. Our receivers were so good. Like am I just in my 20s again? And he goes, no. He goes, you start comping these rosters. Like you can look, go look at 2001, 2002 Pitt Panthers. We were awesome. 
first round picks, second round picks, third round picks all across the team. Underachieved. Uh, we weren't twelve and zero, but man, we had some, we had some elite teams with some really next level players. So Coach Narduzzi is like, hey, and you may see that on the wall. Attitude, effort, are two of the big pillars for him. And then toughness and knowledge is all about what it takes to be a Pitt Panther right now. He goes, talk about the attitude of the receivers. So I went over to twelve or fourteen wideouts, and and I talked about that, and I talked about how the standard every day was set by our position group. I mean, Antonio Bryant is the best receiver I've ever seen. Larry Fitzgerald was my roommate. <laughs> I've covered Marquise Lee and Robert Woods and all these elite players, Jordan Addison, right? Like so many award-winning wideouts. Antonio can move the best, the most fluid, the most athletic, most competitive, most dynamic. Larry was too, right? So you just take that into consideration. We would roll dudes. <laughs> I mean, every day. And we were going up against Shante Spencer and Torrey Cox. These are like, first, second, third round picks who played a while in the NFL. We it was it was insane. The competitiveness was off the hook. So got to share that with a group, which was really fun for me to stay connected to this group. So that was fun. And uh yeah, I've just been gawking, like walking around the facility. Well like just just gawking man. That's that's so cool. And it's funny too because like you think like, you know, the last twenty years, your history with Pitt maybe not quite as relevant to the West Coast football, but now you're you're an AC, you're an ACC country home, of, we go. home of Cal and Stanford, um, which you know again we're we're all still getting used to uh, how this whole thing works. But it was funny because earlier this week, the uh, on Monday the the coaches poll came out, so it's our first kind of litmus test on what people are thinking about it. And I'm seeing four teams from the ACC in the top 25. We see Florida State at 10, Clemson at 14, Miami. At 19, we get it to them. With the, they're all the West Coast ties there, and then NC State at, at 22. So four teams there. That's the same amount that of uh, what would have been the Pac-12 back in the day last year: uh, Oregon, Utah, Arizona, USC. So theoretically, the the top of the ACC is somewhat comparable to the top of what would would have been the, the Pac-12 this year. So when we look at like Stanford and Cal and coming into this new conference. And obviously, a lot is going to be made about the travel that they have to go through, and which you're you're getting a taste of that so far. And I, <laughs> not easy so far this off season. Um, but how, how do you think? You know, obviously, they're they have some stud players on the team, but as a whole team, how do you think they're going to fare uh, stacking up in this new conference? Yeah, it's it's a beautiful question. So two things. Let's talk about the travel. I don't think traveling to the East Coast in terms of like flying 2,700 miles is, is as big of a deal as people think. What is a big deal is the body clock. I was up till three in the morning, East Coast time, wide awake. I didn't drink coffee. I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't do anything other than try to fall asleep. So I just say that like when you are, uh, when you have performance anxiety, which is natural and I think it's a good thing. When you have a game coming the next day and you're flying out on Friday, and a lot of the teams on the West Coast are, are not doing what teams what a lot of teams in the NFL do. A lot of teams in the NFL leave on a Thursday. There's different ideologies, right? Like the Seahawks under Pete Carroll would leave on a Thursday because science would say it takes y- your body uh, your body adjusts one hour per day. So if you're there for two days, then you can kind of adjust, right? I believe the Rams, they don't do that. They don't change at all. It's just like they're playing in San Francisco. They fly out after practice. They go there. It's in and out and like, don't worry about it. Towards the middle of the season, I think when you're a little worn down, end of the season, this is where I think travel is going to get people. I really, when you're not accustomed to it. And the way the schedule is set up, like the people in the ACC or in the Big Ten, they made it so like you're not going back to back weeks to the East Coast. I almost think you might rather that now as I'm thinking through this, you know, concept of just trying to get adjusted to it. You know, it's, it's, it, that is going to be a thing, I think, later in the season. Team-wise, came off the tour at Washington. I went to Oregon. I'm at Pitt. I'm going to go to Penn State later, uh, later this week. I'm going to Ohio State, Rutgers. Here's my early theory, is that most teams are going to look the same. Cal and Pitt, I've seen Cal practice. I've seen Stanford practice. I think they're going to look a lot like the Pitt Panthers. I really do. I think the NC State's the world. I think the... Uh, you know, Miami, Clemson, Florida State probably look a little different coming off the bus. 
I haven't seen anybody look like Oregon. They look like an NFL team. Monsters, right? UW did a nice job recruiting. Uh, they look different than Pitt, for instance. They look different than Cal. But I think the majority of teams are in the ACC, especially when we're talking about the two newcomers coming in. I don't think there's going to be a dramatic difference. I really don't. I, I think when you comp like the Pac-12, uh, Oregon was always a little different than everybody. Um, I think that SC always had different skill than everybody. Uh, Oregon State, you could argue that offensive front looked different in the backs. But everybody else kind of looked the same. Arizona State, Arizona, Cal, Stanford. So I think that's what it's going to be. So I think the margin for error just continues to get smaller and smaller. And that's what's fun being in practice. I mean, the competitive drills here at Pitt today were reminiscent of the competition I felt at UW and at Oregon so far. The skill level is not what I saw at those two places necessarily, but that's why it's an 11-person game. Like, it's the ultimate team game. So it'll be fun to watch those. I think those games could go either way. I wished I was calling Cal Pitt, but I'm going to get on the table that that is a CW game and that is a Max Brown <laughs> game written all over it. So I'm hoping Max is calling that. Uh, on the CW. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing for those schools because I don't know where the draft is. I don't know that, know that well enough. Uh, but Max would kill it, and to come back to a place where you, you play a little bit would be pretty fun. Ready, set, use French fries to go. Yeah, oil from French fries. Turn yesterday's leftovers into today's fuel. More power, lower emissions. 76 renewable diesel fuels all the ways you go, go, go. All right, story time before we get to our interview with Jay Keeps. I am sitting in the team room. In 2001, I sat in this very same room at a chair right over there, and I'm watching film. And in comes a guy named Michael Fountain. In comes a guy named Kirk Herbstreet. And in comes a guy um, named Dave Revson. And, and they came in, and they were working the game. Dave was working radio. Kirk was calling the game. Michael was producing College Game Day. And they all asked me, like, hey, tell me about the team. And I knew those guys were kind of, but I'm a pretty friendly guy. So I just started talking about it. this is what we're trying to do on third down. This is what we're doing on special teams. We find a little weakness. And I start talking to him. And I said, well, what do you do? Do you have another job, Irvy? And he goes, no, this is my only job. And I said, well, you're not a teacher. You're not a lawyer. You're not a doctor. You're not a therapist. You're, you're not selling insurance. Like you're not a radio host. Like this is your job. And he goes, yeah. And I said, oh boy. Hey, Michael Fountain, you went to Pitt. Michael Fountain was producing college game day, running game day at the time. I think first eight years of game day. And I said, this is your job too? And he goes, yeah. And I said, okay, I need to hang out. And I spent about two hours with Herb Street. And then I asked my head coach, Walt Harris, can I start sitting in on production meetings every Friday with the talent of games, the producers and the directors of games? He said, sure. I ran out to the game day truck on a Friday night after a team meeting in front of what was then called Heinz Field and sat in the production truck to learn about it. And that moment at all one began a ritual of every Friday I would meet the talent as they came in. I would meet Bo Garrett. I would meet Todd Blackledge. I would meet all of the people that would come in and call a game. I say that because I just shared that with members of the team earlier today. And I said, and I, and I just say it of like, now it's such a transactional world. Pitt has more than 40 new players, 44. Think about that. They have Jake Overman from Oregon State is a tight end here, right? They're starting, maybe their starting quarterback is a transfer from Alabama. The guy competing with him at quarterback is from the state of Texas, right? It's a transient sport now, even in my alma mater. So I just say all that of to the college athletes watching. I know a lot of pick guys are going to watch this. This room changed my life. I don't meet Jim <laughs> Thornby. We definitely don't start Y option. 100% not working for the Big Ten Network. We're creating our own media company if I don't have a conversation with Kirk Herbstreit. So I just urge all the athletes watching, like, take off your helmet and take off your blinders and don't be a transaction around NIL. Be a human being. Go meet the EJ Borghetti. Go meet the SID at your respective school. Go meet producers like Jim Thornby. Go meet talent like me. I gave out my number today more than I ever have <laughs> at any stop. And that's how it should be. And I'll do what Herbie did to me, which is stay connected throughout my whole career, to any of these guys. And, and I just share that. Like, I know we're long-winded on the open before our interview with Jay Keeves, but I just think it's really important to remind athletes that you know you're not all going to go to the NFL. I hope you do and keep dreaming. But leverage your school. Leverage your place. Leverage the people that walk through those doors. Because when you're done playing, they're not going to be as easy to get a hold of. Period. End of story. So with that, a guy who's really leveraged his career is our interview today, presented by our founding partner, 76. His name is Jake Heaps. You probably know that name if you follow football. 
If you love Pitt or Pittsburgh, you know that. If you love the NFL, you probably know that. He played in the NFL for a little while on the Jets and the Seahawks. He trains Russell Wilson, among many others. He's our head coach at the Elite 11. Uh, but most importantly, I think, his journey is really special. In 09, he was the Elite 11 MVP, best quarterback in America. Goes to BYU, starts as a true freshman, thinks he's going to, you know, here we go. Here's three and out. And year two, it, it doesn't happen. He struggles. Ends up transferring to Miami, ends up transferring to Kansas, finds his way eventually into the NFL and just kind to find his way. And he has. So we talk about the journey that he went on and how everybody who sits in these team room chairs, the one common thing I can promise you is that the journey you think you're going to go on will not go exactly as you imagine. So today's conversation presented by our founding partner, 76, is a guy who has gone, gone, gone to a bunch of different places, but now is firmly entrenched into impacting people through teaching, educating, and loving the game of football, specifically the quarterback position. Today's interview presented by 76, Jake Keeps. Jake, fired up having you, man. Uh, it's a cool setting. We're at the Elite 11 finals. Yeah. You've been on the regional tour. You're the lead voice of Elite 11 this year. You've been a part of Elite 11 forever. Mm -hmm. I think of 09 when you won the MVP yeah. Yeah. in my first year. <laughs> when you think of the context of your quarterback journey, there, there's a lot to it. If you were to boil it down, what do you think you describe it with? Oh man, I I think the easiest way for me to boil it all down is just the love and passion for the game. I think that is the only reason why this has been able to come full circle is my love and passion as a young kid pursuing and chasing the dream, right? And then going through the craziness of my college career. I think it would break a lot of people. I think it would make people bitter towards the game. But my love and passion for the game continue to keep me in it, continue to keep me chasing that dream of playing in the NFL. And then I go and do that and pursue that, accomplish that goal, and then get cut and get to that point where it comes to that finality of, all right, it's over, right? You're not playing anymore. There's nowhere else to go. And then transitioning that into coaching and diving back into the next generation and giving back and wanting to be a part of it from all levels, from the NFL level, working with Russell Wilson to the you know local youth kid that is chasing that same dream that I did back in the day, right? And then obviously tying it back full circle to now being a part of the Elite 11, been doing that for years and now being the head coach of the Elite 11, I just I, I smile at it because this game has given me so much and it offers so much other than just the ball that you have in your hands between the white lines and it's up to you to take advantage of it. I just keep imagining you as like shaved head, 16 year old, <laughs> you know, not in much has changed, you know. <laughs> uh, but I remember that you, you always ha you, you have the same smile and spirit that, that you have now. It's a long time ago, though. Mm. What do you recall from back in the day that now when you look at this generation of quarterbacks and you say similarities, differences? I know aesthetically it's totally different, yeah. but similarities at the soul of the position. I wonder if you see any or is it totally changed? I think that there's some similarities in the, in the fact that adversity is going to hit you. That is undefeated. It's never going to change, right? There's no way around it. There's no parent that can, you know, circumnavigate their kid all the way through the process to the NFL and then never experience any adversity. Adversity is going to hit you. And so it's just a matter of when and how big and how you're going to handle that adversity. I think that remains the same across time. Now, aesthetically, you say it changed. Absolutely. I also think that social media has taken such a life of its own and maybe it's part of that aesthetic that you talk about, but it's such a huge factor in today's day and age in terms of the gratification process, in terms of how they look within and judge themselves or validate themselves on what they're doing, how they do it, because everybody has a microphone now. When I was coming through, there was only a certain number of pieces, a certain number of talking heads that gave their opinion and you knew their name. Now, Joe Schmo down the street can start his own website and get his own following and have a scouting report on you, act like they know who you are, what you're about, and, and, and try to change the narrative about who you are. And I think for these guys that are handling this position now, it is the hardest time 
for quarterbacks out of any period to come up and play this position. And I look at that as an exciting aspect as a coach because now it's up to us to help bulletproof these guys and help prepare them as to how they're going to handle all of these different things that are going to come across their way. But ultimately, I think it comes down to who you are, are you comfortable with who you are, and when adversity hits, are you prepared for that? Bulletproof yourself. I think that's an interesting statement. You went best quarterback in America, started as a freshman at BYU, mm. and then by the time your college career ended, you were at three different colleges. This was pre transfer Before portal. it was popular. Yeah, yeah. Before everybody was, <laughs> was just dipping. Uh, I never felt like you ran from adversity. I felt like you dealt with it and then had to pivot based on circumstance. What do you wish that you knew? Like if you said you could bulletproof or you want to help guys be bulletproof now, yeah. which, which is kind of impossible, uh, you're going to catch stray here and there. Mm -hmm. how, how do you wish you were? You know, I really, there's, there's two things. Number one, first and foremost, that college is a business. This is a business. And now more than ever, it's almost like the NFL. And when we were playing, I mean, people were trying to cut guys and replace them with scholarship guys. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before. And Coach Carroll, when he went to SC and brought this NFL mentality and recruited every single five-star player that he possibly could, and then he would sit them all down and tell them, guess what? I told you all the same exact thing. We are competing together to strive for greatness. And if you can beat this guy out, it doesn't matter how many years he's been a starter or how many years he's been here. It's about who can help us be the best team that we can possibly be, right? And most coaches aren't real with kids. They lie to them. They, they, um, they just try to get through the moment so that they can nab this kid for the rankings. And then once they get them, it's a completely different story, right? So for me, as, as, a, as, as someone that went to a really, really special high school at Skyline High School in Washington and had a really, I was fortunate to play under Steve Jervis and Matt Taylor and guys that really cared about the development of, of the athlete. And as a high school coach, you have to, right? And also you have the luxury of that. Hey, we might not be good this year, but man, next year, these guys are going to be developed. They're going to be bigger right? That whole thing. In college, you don't have that. And now with the transfer portal and everything else, it's okay, let me, let me go get that from some other college program now. It's even more so. And so I think I wish I would have gone into that process with um, a, being less naive to that fact and understanding that I've got to perform now. Interesting. How do you think you would advise balancing college being naive, as you said, mm -hmm. it being a business. Yep. But still play it with joy. Oh, yeah. Play a game. Like, what do you, because cause you hear the phrase, it's a business. I think the next sentence is, it's not a game. All right. But it is a game. And you've been around, you've been a pro. Yes. You can still have fun yeah, when you make money. No question. No question. And, and I didn't know how to do that until I got to the NFL. Until I actually got to be around Coach Carroll. And it was, man, it is fun to compete with other great players. It is fun to go to work every day knowing that everybody has the same mindset, the same goal, and we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. Now, I'm competing with the guy next to me for money and a starting job and, and all of those things, but we can enjoy the heck out of the process on a daily basis. And I wish that I would have understood that, embraced that a little bit more. Um, and the other aspect of it is, is it is a game. So how do you tap into that? And you have to rely on the childlike joy that you have playing the game, the passion and drive that I talked about earlier to be your compass through the whole process and not let your emotions dictate how you act on a daily basis, right? What's your goals? What, you, what are you trying to accomplish? What's your routine that you've set for yourself? Win, lose, no matter what, you're going to stick to those principles and you're going to stick to, you know, kind of what you set up for yourself on a daily basis. And that is going to allow you to be the best version of yourself. As you know, we talked to the parents at Elite 11. Mm -hmm. It's really a blast. And, and I have a ton of empathy for that because you're trying to guide your son in the quarterback world in a landscape. There isn't really a roadmap. 
at least not one that's a blueprint yet, mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. For you, I, I wonder when you reflect upon what you went through, how are your folks, like, as you navigated multiple schools, and then now, being on the tour, being in Lululemon for so long, in this to era today, mm -hmm. what would you say to parents that are saying, hey, like, I know I need to help navigate, but I don't really know how to drive this car right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that it is so crazy because they're really on the frontier of this. There's no handbook. There wasn't a handbook back then. And, and I think back to what my parents did is one, they did everything they could to feed that passion that I had. And they really let me steer the ship in regards to, do you love this? I remember them asking me all the time to the point where I would get really annoyed with them and mad like, yes, I love it. Okay, stop asking me. But they kept wanting to ask me because of everything they knew it would take for me to get where I wanted to go. The investment that I would have to take, right? We didn't have a quarterback trainer available to us at the time in Seattle, Washington. We had to drive three hours to Portland, Oregon to go train with somebody, you know, and we did that every weekend. That's a huge sacrifice and investment. So do you love it? Does your son love it? First and foremost. And the second aspect of it is you, I can understand being protective and especially now in this environment where there's money involved and all these things now. Um, I can't even imagine being in their shoes. But the one thing that I would say along the process is make sure that football, that NIL deals, that everything else that's coming along at these kids and at these families is not the number one conversation all day, every day that you have a relationship with your son outside of these things so that they know that you that they are loved with or without any of these things. And that may be obvious to them. That might be that might go without saying, but to your son, it's about what you show them. It's about what you do on a daily basis. And I think back sometimes with my family, they loved me to death. They tried to do everything possible to put me in the best position. But at some point, everything starts steering towards football and the football career and what you're doing and how you're going about it that you kind of forget to be a family, right? And you don't really have anything else to fall back on in terms of the relationship, in terms of how you interact with each other on a daily basis. And so when adversity hits or tough times come and your son is searching for answers, if football is the only relationship that you have, then I think it's going to crumble at some point, to be honest with you. You need to have something so much more deeper where they can come to you and know that they can be themselves, that they can go through those struggles and that they can escape, you know, go whatever it is that you guys do as a family, go do that. Um, and I think that's really important for them to understand and realize sometimes that take a beat for a second from the football stuff. Yeah, I mean, you're, it's, it's hard because it's just, the daily yeah. conversation. I think if we looked at like um, a Wikipedia page of you, right? We looked at your bio. If we stopped at your playing career, I would say this as someone who's a quote unquote analyst in football, I'd say, yeah, he's probably going to well, take some time away from the game. Mm -hmm. I wonder what his relationship is like with the game. I would have said it's probably soiled a little bit of toxic toxicity around the game. No question. But, but you have broadcast you have coach you work with uh, Russ Wilson you're now right in the league 11 like why how did you navigate that like is that true like were you able to fluid in that toxicity or was it what was it non-existent and I just like saying no there was toxicity and and that's what made my career the journey that it was and it's not always going to be perfect right and it's either through things that you do yourself that you wish you could have done better on the field, off the field. There's also things that are outside of your control, coaches and how they handle adversity. Um, you know, the, the, the boosters around you. There's all these different things, right? <clears throat> but that fueled my drive to help others and help the next generation of quarterbacks navigate that process. Because how quickly did, you, did it turn to fuel? Uh, very quickly, very quickly. I, I would say, I would say it, it took a couple years because at first it, I was reeling, right? 
here I was, number one quarterback in the country, uh, was a freshman All-American, ready to you know set my sails and go into the NFL and be a first-round pick. All those things crumble, and now I'm reeling and I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I get myself back on track? Why did this happen? This wasn't part of my story. This wasn't part of my plan. Why is this going on? And so there's this question. And and then your confidence gets shaken. Wait, a coach didn't like me for me or he didn't like some aspect about me? Why, right? And so you're, you're dealing with that. And then eventually, once you get through that, it really took me my second year when I was at the University of Kansas where I really found myself again in regards to, you know what? What made me great, what made me who I was, was that I just got lost in the work. I got lost in the love of getting better and striving to get better and enjoying it with my teammates and having that common goal together, right? And including them in my journey. It wasn't me alone. This is a, this is a team game, the greatest team game of all time. So pouring into my teammates and, and letting them know how much I care about them and how much I care about their success. And you start getting back to the joy of playing the game again, right? Because you have those relationships. And so that's really where it all started to come together again for me. And there were disappointments along the way still, but I really had found myself. And then by the time college had ended, I was going for it in the NFL. Uh, you know, it was full bore, man. Like I was, I was going for it no matter what. Had the opportunity in, you know, with the Jets my rookie year and then with the Seahawks and I got to tell you, I mean, the best versions of myself was in high school and in the NFL, funny enough. And um, and in the NFL, it was, and with Coach Carroll, it was just so easy to just go in and just be at your best every day. Just know that that's all you got to do. Yeah, I used to always say when I first started at SC with Pete, I would call my teammates from Pitt and I'd be like, guys, I just... I wish you could like, like I wish like because I even felt like God, if I could add more eligibility I'd be an even better version of myself like I'd play free or yeah. have more fun and all those things absolutely do you think for you now when you look at the game you look at it through a healthy lens and I'm curious what you would say to these quarterbacks because as, as Chris Peterson mm-hmm. shared with us last year and the quarterbacks yeah at 11 was the only guarantee is that it's not going to go how you envision it mm-hmm. like is there is there a thought is it like so true compete to find the joy compete to get lost in the work like what is it because it is going to become a world that has an exit door you can take yep anytime or one that will hit you with adversity and you're gonna have to deal with it and it's probably going to be in your dms moment by moment Mm -hmm. yeah i it's it's a great question yogi i think it's different for each guy but i think overall you have to get lost in the work and there was a there was a sign that I used to look at when I trained. This was, I hadn't played much after Miami. This is getting ready for my pro day for three months straight, six six days out of the week, right? I'm grinding as hard as I can. And it, and the and the thing said, the sign said above the, the door, it says you can't cheat the grind. It knows how much you've put in. And that to me was everything, right? Is, are you putting in the work? Are you getting yourself as prepared as humanly possible, both physically, mentally, spiritually? And if you do those things, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to worry about, Yogi, because one, you're going to be successful on the field. Number two, you're going to be successful in life. And number three, no matter what is being said about you, no matter what is going on around you, you know who you are and you know the people that love you and who you're actually getting the right advice from and you're and you're not going to go wrong because you're going to be at peace and that's what I want for these kids is I want them to be at peace with who they are I want them to be at peace with their process and if they can be at peace it doesn't matter if they transfer when they get to the next level it doesn't matter if they are the starter or the backup that they will have the tools to be successful whatever they decide to do and I think as you look at this process now, how many quarterbacks have we seen from this Elite 11 process end up having to transfer? More than and, 50%. And coming out on the other side of it, right? No doubt. Bo Nix, right? Jaden Daniels. Jaden Daniels. And Caleb Williams, Bo Nix. I mean, it's impressive. It's impressive because it's hard. I know to go in a new environment, 
to have to relearn everything again and to still have that confidence to say, you know what, it didn't work out in this other place, but it's going to work out here and now, and I'm going to own it. And I think those guys had a unique gift and a unique trait of being able to do those three things that I just described. Yeah, I, I have this like flash of all the players who've transferred at least once. Mm-hmm. And all the ones that found success have said the same thing in our conversations, which is a version of, I just threw myself into getting to know my teammates. Yeah. It wasn't like I was solo in the office studying and filming. Like, of course, that was a part of it. But their first sentence is like, I was competing to get to know guys. I didn't say a lot. I just did the work. I just competed to get to know guys. Weight room, workouts, weight room, workouts. So I ask you this as we, as we uh, finish up here. Yeah. The theme at Elite 11 in 2024 is chase what matters. So we're trying to educate these players to find with clarity what matters most, state it with confidence, not be BS about it, and then have a disciplined, tactile strategy how to go attack it. Right. So for you, as somebody who's now uh, the face and the voice of Elite 11, as well as someone who's been in this profession and has played at the highest of levels and had a turbulent collegiate career, to say the least, and mm-hmm. uh, what what matters most to, to you when you look at this position in the sport? What matters the most is that this is a team game. That's it. It's as simple as that. It's not about you. It's not about your journey and your process and what you've done up to that point. This is a whole new opportunity to learn your teammates again. So a whole new opportunity to reinvest into the guys around you and to create those bonds that you already have experience doing. From the time you were young and now getting into high school, now you get to redo that all over again at the college level. Now, when I went to the Seahawks with uh, our quarterback coach, Carl, Carl Smith, everybody call him Tater, he's the greatest, right? He would play a game with us called Know Your Seahawks. And he would quiz us on, I mean, it was the, the, at the time, so you have a 90-man roster and then you get down to a 56-man roster, right? And so he would do this in the spring with us, right? And it would be the 90th guy on the roster. What's his number? What school he's from? Tell me one interesting fact about him, right? And Tater would do this himself. And so he would know all these facts about everybody else on the team. And so he really would make sure that you're doing your job by knowing your teammates. And I found out that as I started doing that, it wasn't just to pass the test in my QB meeting room with Tater, but I started to become deeply connected to my teammates and to my team. And it, and it became more fun to show up in the building every day. And man, I know everybody and everybody's saying hi to me and what that made me feel. And the confidence that I ended up getting by knowing my teammates and taking interest in them and, hey, you know, do you have a place to eat tonight or, you know, get, wh- where do we want to go? Okay, you like playing basketball. Can we go play a pickup game at some point, right? Doing things with my teammates and taking interest in them ended up making me a better teammate, which made me a better quarterback. And I think for these guys, they're so wrapped up in their journey. The spotlight is constantly on them. It's all about them, right? That's their whole world. That they lose sight of the ability to connect with everybody else around them. And I think that that's why we have such a high miss rate with some of the top, with all these top quarterbacks every single year. Some guys get it. Yeah. It's a a good point. I, I, I believe this to my core for every coach, college coach listening. I think recruits are asking the appropriate questions in this time in the sport, which is, can you get me to the next level? Mm -hmm. What's my NAL deal? What's the coaching going to be like? And what I believe with all of me, Jake, is that coaches should be front-loading when kids get to campus. Hey, right down the hall, we've got eight rooms. The doors are wide open. Those are eight licensed mental health experts. Yep, high-performance psychologists all the way down the line. And I just think front-loading that with these guys because you're right. Versity's going to hit yep. in a version of it. We don't know what it's going to look like. It mm-hmm. might be one that you dealt with, I dealt with, somebody dealt with, who knows. But it's going to hit. And I think that everybody in sport, in this sport, knows that is something you can't run from. But but people do. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. I just, I would love our sport to make that turn where 
it's truly destigmatized so much so that we don't have to say the word destigmatize like opening that door and i wonder for you yeah if that was the case at any of your stops like would it have been different and your college experience maybe mirror high school in the nfl oh no question it would have and i and i think you you hit the nail on the head there's two twofold to that of when they first arrive and for all the college coaches that are listening to this, please listen to this, is I do agree with the mental performance aspect of it. Weaponizing and giving your kids the opportunity to be bulletproof to adversity that either you present them or that the outside presents them. Because this is the first time that they are really experiencing the full fandom, right? It is fandom. Fandom is short for fanatic, right? So these are a bunch of fanatics that love their team, also, don't treat their players very well, right? This is a performance-based business. What do you do for me? And so those kids are really dealing with that for the first time, okay? So I agree with that. The second thing is be honest. Be honest. And give your kids the tools to be successful. Give them a roadmap and constantly give feedback. And I'm sure that it's more difficult now that you have the ability to go into the transfer portal any second but I promise you, watch. As If you are honest with them and you show them a path and are consistent with your message, they will respond to that more than lying to them because that's what kids struggle with. They struggle with people lying to them and they struggle with trust in regards to, is this coach really have my best interest at heart? And for some, they don't. They don't care if you're just another guy. But if you show that you actually care for these kids and give them that feedback and show them, hey, you're a freshman. If you do X, Y, and Z, you're going to be on your way. But don't just plop them down and expect them to do right, right? you got to give these kids grace or you got to show them the roadmap or else you're doing it wrong. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a fun point and an interesting one where Due to the pseudo call it professionalization of the sport and mm-hmm. transactional element within college football now, I think that coaches are getting more to the truth than ever before because it's like, hey, Jake, this is what you need to do play. And if you don't, you're probably just not gonna. And I and what gets lost maybe is the connection. So it's this real unique dance among this sport of like 20 new faces come in that are not freshmen. Yeah. You gotta love them up. But you also gotta tell them the truth because it's, it's a really interesting time at this age I'm not saying it's easy no doubt yeah Yeah. it's a a really good point by you and uh we could talk about it forever man yeah um and we will we'll do it again thank you again for that always a blast Yogi thanks man it's the afterglow Jim Thornby there Yogi Roth here that's right Pitt's team room that was Jay Keeps presented by our founding partner 76 this is the part where we talk about our takeaways things we wish we would have asked Jim you're in the room we did this this summer at the Elite 11 Curious what you thought about then, and now we need to think about it now after editing it and um, producing it. It's it's really cool because uh, again, and I and I keep going back to this with a lot of the people we've already talked to so far uh, on this podcast is humility. Um, you know, and his his story of you know being that number one high school quarterback in the country and the plan not working out the way that he thought it was. And, you know, him being able to then still turn that into a successful football career, you know, not, not everything is going to be, you know, you're the number one pick in the, in the NFL draft and you're going to play 12 years in the NFL. Like it's to, you know, to your point, how you said it in the beginning with, with yourself, you know, you, you, you had that meeting with the ESPN folks and now you're here, uh, you know, when you were a player. So it's. Uh, I get it. It's the humility and getting to meet Jake in person uh, down there. Um, he, he couldn't have been a, a, a more kind and just open individual about like welcoming me in, you know, my first trip there to the elite 11, like he, he could not have been cooler. And, um, and, and I also then just want to, again, pop you guys up about what you guys do for those quarterbacks at the elite 11. It, it is amazing. It's, it, it's amazing. Um, uh, I know, I've said it before, but it's they're really lucky to have you guys, and you're you guys are really lucky to have them. So it's a really a really cool symbiotic relationship there. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's that's well said. I appreciate that, and, and that's the goal. Like Coach Carroll taught me this a long time ago. Of if you had one of your best friends come to practice, what would they say? 
what what would you want them to say? And I think at the Elite Eleven, all of us, from Brian Stump to Jake and everybody on down, want you to say a version of what you just referenced. I think my takeaways after listening back to it and thinking about Jake Heaps is he's also gone through a lot of adversity, right? Think about when Russell Wilson was in Denver, right? Jake Heaps was the guy that was in the facility, and his name got drugged through the mud a little bit. And and what did Jake do? He he used it as an opportunity to keep learning, keep growing, keep teaching. And I think every quarterback at some point, whether it's mid-game and you're struggling or you throw a couple picks and your position is questioned or whatever it may be, like anyone in life is going to meet adversity. And Jake has always had this beautiful lens on life. And I think it's because of what he went through as a young player. You know, he's always had tremendous humility. Uh, and now I see him at this stage. He's got a bunch of kids. He's got this beautiful family. He wants to just keep pouring back into the game. And it'll be fun to see how the Steelers thing shakes out with Russell and Justin Fields. And did they play two? Did they name one? Like, who knows how that'll go? But we, for Jake, I think that one of the best traits of a human being is observing how they show up. And Jake constantly shows up in a beautiful way. He has for me on many occasions. He did for this show. He's done it for so many quarterbacks around the country. Uh, and I hope you felt that in the episode. We're going to bring Jake on throughout the season because he's got just a good lens on the position around the country and college and the NFL as why often just keeps rolling. Remember, we're going to give you college football through the lens of the West Coast. So that means Pittsburgh and the ACC through the lens of the West Coast. That means at times elite quarterback play through the lens of the West Coast. We'll go there. So let us know what you think about this episode. We love the conversation, uh, yoption.com within the Substack app. What do you think? Share it. Give us a post. Uh, we've gotten so many powerful emails, Jim, from coaches and NFL scouts and people all across the football landscape. Keep them coming. We thank you for that. Uh, I am on my way to keep this tour going. On my way to State College, then Rutgers, then Ohio State, then Indiana, then Purdue, and then USC and UCLA, Nebraska, and Michigan State and Michigan. Uh, so why am I saying that? At yoption.com, we will give you a breakdown of every one of those training camps. So that is coming. Uh, appreciate all the love and support, Jake, for your time. Pitt, for your facility. I'll just kind of give you a little glance here. Then I'm about to walk out of this joint, hop in the car. And drive that before that special teams that. meeting comes in and kicks you out, right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna get out of here. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, we'll end this one a little different. Hail the pit. Peace. Peace.